especially through the uh, intercession of good John the Baptist, whose feast we celebrate today, and we ask your Lord be with us, and, uh, that whatever we say, whatever we do, is always in accord with you and with the great plan. We pray, Jesus, that uh, the work we do for evangelization will bear great fruit in our time, especially in this place of the Diocese of Orange, and that many souls will be saved and brought to, to our frail, sometimes meager, but always sincere efforts. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do, um, we'll have that Facebook live. She's going to give you a mic here in a second. I just started. Okay. That's okay. I'm enough with this. So um, we have four segments. Um, we're going to do 13, 14, 14, and 13. So we'll take breaks. But this is actually on three radio networks. Okay, it's on Rolled Up Radio, it's on ESNI for our Spanish friends, and it's also on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Uh, that gets more of a primarily East Coast. Okay. So we're going to be, um, you know, covering the country in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the bulk of it is going to be Southern California, though. Okay. And so forth. Here you go, Deacon. Um, and we will try to air this within the next two weeks. We'll let you know okay. when it's aired. Especially about the Emmaus Institute to promote it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Okay, go. Hello, everyone. This is Deacon Steve Greco, and we are high atop the Tower of Hope in beautiful Christ Cathedral, and I am so excited. I'm just jumping out of my skin because one of my favorite priests and someone who I'm just so blessed to get to know even more over the last few months, Father Al Baca is with us in the studio. And Father is the Director for Evangelization and Faith Formation for the Diocese of Orange. Welcome to Empowered by the Spirit, Father. Thank you, Deacon. And that's the Diocese of Orange in California because as you know, there is another Diocese of Orange in Florida. Absolutely. This so. is the diocese. We're here in Garden Grove, California, in the Diocese of Orange of California. Uh, and certainly, and you're a native, right? I am. I am. I was born here uh, and uh, grew up in Garden Grove, just under the shadow of uh, Crystal Cathedral at the time. I saw it go up. Uh, I went to school at St. Columban's in, uh, from first grade to eighth grade. And then after that, public school. And after that, uh, Cal State Fullerton. And then eventually seminary, but all my life here. Well, that's wonderful. And a big part of what we do is encourage vocations on this show. Right, right. And tell us, and, and I believe very strongly through the Holy Spirit that some men and women who are considering religious vocations are listening in right now and, and getting that nudge. And tell us about your nudge and how you said yes to become a priest. Well, when I uh, look at uh, where it all started with me, it, it really goes back actually to St. Columbans and it goes back to the nuns, the uh, Sisters of Charity, Irish Sisters of Charity at the time. And uh, they just took really good care of me and every once in a while asked the question, do you think you might want to be a priest? And I'm sure they asked everybody that, but you know, <laughs> you know, but a few of us, you know, caught the bug or something, right. and uh, they were very, very um, beautiful about the whole thing. And then we had very, very fine priests also, diocesan priests, and so that's what I grew up with. I really didn't go up, grow up with religious orders. Um, so from, you know, very, very young, I, I had the idea there. I, I'd say in high school it sort of faded away a little bit, and then when I got into college, then it sort of uh, came back big time. and. Um, was uh, interested in the Dominicans, and I was really uh, looking actually to enter a religious life, but then decided to stay right here in the Diocese of Orange, and it was a good decision. So 1989, you were ordained? That's right, 1989. Yeah, and then what happened after that? Um, then I was sent to uh, San Angelo Marici for my first assignment in Brea, and had a number of assignments after that. And then the surprise of uh, Bishop Todd inviting me to do further studies. Uh, in uh, Rome. So I went to the Angelicum and there I got my license in ecumenism and interreligion. Tell us about that because that is, you know, for me, so fascinating. 
Um, and we don't hear that much about it, but it is so important that we reach out to to others in terms of sharing our faith and, and really trying to understand their faith. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's, it is really important, and uh, especially for the church of our day. Uh, when I was in Rome studying, uh, I happened to be there the year that uh, St. John Paul II died and the year that Pope Benedict was elected. So it was an extraordinary time to be there. And uh, when I first got there, uh, Pope John Paul II was doing an awful lot with um, uh, ecumenical gestures, uh, especially with the Orthodox Church. So I, I was able to watch and see how he approached all of this. And it was always from the, the confidence of truth and the confidence that God wanted this and the confidence that uh, God would make it happen, that if walls were gonna fall, human beings can't do it by themselves at all, uh, but that with God, nothing is uh, impossible. And he came out with uh, uh, a wonderful uh, approach called the healing of memories. And that was sort of uh, uh, an interesting path because uh, it makes sense on a human level. You know, you have two people, they get into an argument. Maybe the argument is long lasting, it, there's a lot of wounds. Maybe somewhere along the way, they wonder if there could be a reconciliation. How do we do that? And so then, well, the way we do that is we approach each other, we start talking again, and we have to go through the painful part of looking over what really happened and then begin to heal from there. And so John Paul II took that model, kind of briefly laid out for you, and he put that in terms of churches. And he said the same thing happens with churches as happens with human beings, is that sometimes there are these moments in history where there are um, disagreements, breaks, uh, wounds, whether that be with the East, the Orthodox churches, or with uh, the Protestant churches. Uh, and so then um, we have to go back to each individual um, moment and each individual church to begin to see what went wrong and to honestly look at um, history. And John Paul II was great for this where he said the, the Catholic Church should never be afraid of history and she never has to be afraid of mistakes that were made. Um, she just needs to work with them and then move into, you know, uh, an area where they can be resolved. So um, that was what in influenced me tremendously um, in my own ministry. And when I came back to the Diocese of Orange, and I was made the director for ecumenism and interreligion for about 10 years and really enjoyed it. And, and then two years as the national director for the United States. That had to be incredible. That to be was that. amazing. Yes. Tell us a little. Tell us. Your favorite story in those two years? Mm. My favorite story, well, with uh, my my job was to make sure that all the um, uh, the dialogues were on track, and so we have quite a few dialogues going on in the United States, and that's not only with um, Christian churches, but it's also with other religions that are that uh, mm -hmm. don't hold to the Christian faith, and. Um, with the uh, Jewish community, uh, a lot of what I did had to happen in New York. So there was a lot of traveling involved in this, and so especially with New York because there's a large Jewish community there, but also the Orthodox community, and then there are the other branches of Judaism that are present uh, in good numbers there in New York. But I used to stay at St. Patrick's oh. when I would do all my work and with Cardinal Dolan. And uh, he was just wonderful. I, I really enjoyed uh, being with him and, and kind of, uh, you know, watching and listening to him too. And uh, I think he's a, a, a really a, a great bishop. And uh, I remember I, I came in and he said, you know, if you want to, you can celebrate Mass uh, in my private chapel because it'll be a little hard to do that in, in St. Patrick's with all the tourists. So I said, okay, I, I said, that'd be great. And so uh, I went in and made sure, I looked in and uh, nothing was happening. And he has his chapel there and, the, and where you would have one wall, it's not there. And that begins his quarters, his private quarters, so that he could um, sit in his armchair there and look at the Blessed Sacrament and pray, and which is his custom. And so I went in and I uh, started uh, Holy Mass and uh, I got to um, almost the end of Mass, and I looked up, and there he was sitting in his armchair, uh, reading his breviary, praying his breviary, and, and towards me. And so I uh, just continued with uh, Mass and then finished, 
And then as I was putting my vestments away very, very carefully uh, near him, uh, I said, excuse me, uh, uh, your eminence. And, and he said, uh, yes. And, and I said, I just wanted to know, you wanted to let you know that I offered this mass for you. And then he just stayed quiet for a moment and he said, and I'll take it. <laughs> and I laughed and laughed. And, and that's the way he was. He was just, a, oh. you know, really wonderful, very down to earth. And, um, and I think uh, just uh, working really, really hard for the Lord. That's fantastic. And, and for family reasons, you came back to the Diocese of Orange, correct? Yes, because I'm the only uh, surviving child now in my, of my mother and father. My father is uh, 93, mother's 91. And now they're at that place where uh, life is getting very, very hard for them. And in fact, my father's been in the hospital and I'm bringing him home later today. So uh, it's been about trying to uh, make them comfortable. And, uh, but it was something I couldn't leave off to uh, other folks. Well, you are an excellent son and we pray for your parents Thank and you. pray for your father. Um, so we've got this new position when you came back. Right. Tell us about, I'm so excited to title this show as Evangelization Now, and right. tell us about the new position. Well, I, I'm very excited about it because when I got back, I remember talking to Bishop Van and, and he said, well, what do, you, what do you think you would like to do now that you're back in the diocese? And I said, well, I'd like a little time with my parents. So he gave me about, I think about six months to uh, work with them and to just be full time with my folks even though I lived at uh, a rectory. And, um, and I had said to the bishop, you know, I, I don't mind just being a uh, parochial vicar, just helping out somewhere or uh, I, don't, I don't have a need to be a pastor again. I've done that twice and it's been beautiful, but there are lots of different things that you can do as a, a diocesan priest. And so I don't, I don't feel like I need to you know, be on that track only. And then uh, he came to me later with um, a, a great invitation about evangelization and faith formation. And I was very excited about that because in all the work I've ever done, even in uh, dialogue with other religions and with other Christian churches, um, I always felt like uh, whatever I say, whatever I do, it's evangelization in the sense that I am portraying the church. I'm giving her um, uh, to these people to see. And I would always try to do that in the best way that I could and truthfully because, you know, it never made sense to cut corners. It never does in ecumenism because you cut corners and then later on it's going to be a problem. So you have to speak the truth. You have to be, uh, you know, on board about what the uh, teachings and doctrines are. You have an honest conversation and then maybe a, a new wall falls, you know. And so um, uh, to be offered that, that position, I thought was a, a great gift because uh, I really believe that uh, something needs to happen. And I can see this happening all over the United States. It's not just the Diocese of Orange that has decided to, you know, to focus on evangelization and faith formation in a big way. This is happening everywhere. And to me, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Because when something takes off like that and it becomes a national and even a world concern, um, that to me is God working uh, in spite of us. We see, um, you know, certainly Vatican II, the emphasis on evangelization. Saint Pope John Paul II said it was our supreme duty to evangelize. Yeah. The entire church is formed for evangelization. Yeah. And yet, this is a word, evangelization, that for many people feels like it's a Protestant word or something. Mm -hmm. They don't quite understand. The meaning of evangelization is good news. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very true. And the wonderful thing, if we go back to St. John Paul II, is he uh, was able to bring together teaching, doctrine, and relationship. And this is what's key. Um, and this is what a missionary disciple is, is someone who can um, not only have the head knowledge, the intellectual piece that's very, very important, the uh, orthodoxy, but also the, the heart piece, which is um, how do I bring it across? And so I might, I might provide an example. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, who during uh, Reformation time was made a bishop and sent to Switzerland of all places, which was falling apart. And went there uh, in obedience and uh, did wonderful work and, and brought back at least uh, half of that population back to the Catholic Church. And he did it through patience, kindness, gentleness, and a sense of humor. And it was all about relationship. 
And when you read Francis de Sales, he still makes sense today, like the devout life and so forth, because um, it's all built on, um, for instance, he used to say, if you want to catch uh, bees or flies, um, you put uh, honey, not vinegar, right? And so the whole idea of how do you package the message, that's what I got from that. How do you package the message? I may have the right message, but if I don't package it correctly, then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So um, you have uh, someone who's teaching uh, religious ed in a school after hours, you know, the kids are tired, and then the, the teacher's reading right from the book. So the, the information's going, it's, it's there, but there's no content from the heart. And so because of that, uh, all that goes and then it flies away because uh, kids don't pick up on it because there's nothing to grab onto, right? So uh, when we're, we're talking about our faith, it has to be with witness. And this is what we're, we're hoping to, to produce. This is Deacon Steve Greco. You're on Empowered by the Spirit. We're going to be right back to talk more about evangelization now. We'll be right back. All right, awesome. Yeah, okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Good. So I'm going to get into now uh, talking more about what does it mean to us personally to be a missionary disciple, okay. if that makes sense. Okay. All right. It's Deacon Steve Greco, and we're back on Empowered by the Spirit with the Director of Evangelization and Faith Formation, Father Al Baca, and we're so blessed to have Father Al back in the Diocese of Orange, California. And we were talking before the break about missionary disciples. Pope Francis often speaks about this term, missionary disciples. What's the difference between being just a disciple and being a missionary disciple? Well, I've always thought that there's a little plan and then there's the big plan. And the way I'll, I'll maybe um, uh, talk about that is, uh, the big plan is we're all called into a bigger story. There's a plan of God that is massive um, and it's eternal. And we're called into this story of salvation and how to, to usher in uh, the coming of Christ. Uh, so that I, once I was told um, when you celebrate Holy Mass as a priest, what you're doing is you are enticing the Holy Spirit. You're enticing that moment of divinity to come and, and take hold of the earth, that Maranatha, you know, that uh, every Mass is a, a direct attack and hit on darkness. And it brings us closer and closer to the new kingdom. And I really love that because it means then that my life, my actions, my words um, are a part of this bigger plan and an and a important thread. Um, and you might see it as this wonderful um, uh, when you go to Europe, you see these tapestries, and if there's one or two threads missing, you know, you, you kind of notice it because they begin to tatter and they, the, the image doesn't look right. But when it's restored and all those um, little pieces and uh, breaks are, are mended, then you have this wonderful, you know, scene. And, and I think that's the way it is in the spiritual life, too, is that um, we are all threads. But our thread is very, very necessary for the beauty of the, the picture, of uh, the tapestry. On, a, on the little level, as it were, well, it's very important for me because I need to be evangelized. I need to re-evangelize myself constantly because that is a great deception of um, that somehow I have made it. You know, somehow uh, because I uh, recite my rosary, because um, I go to Mass, even all the, these are wonderful things, right? And that's the, the summit, you know, the beginning and the end of the Christian life, the rosary, the weapon of the Virgin Mary given to us, you know, against darkness and, and heresy and so forth. But, but these do not um, have their, the potential filled, if I could say it that way, until that relationship with Jesus Christ is forefront, right, right in, in the, the center of everything. Um, we all know and remember uh, Father Benedict Rochelle, wonderful, wonderful priest. And uh, I remember a number of times, uh, you know, having conversations with him, and, and he told me one time, um, when Catholics love the church first, in other words, when they come to Catholicism and their faith and their religion through the church first, when something goes wrong in the church, 
um, a lot of them shatter. When Catholics love Jesus Christ first, he teaches them how to love his church, how to love his bride, that's the way he said it. And I thought that is so profound because when I love Jesus Christ, then he teaches me how to deal with the wounds, with the disappointments, and with the humanness of the church. But the other way around, uh, it may not be you know, so successful. This is so powerful, my brothers and sisters. Again, we have Father Al Baca, who is in charge of evangelization and faith formation for the Diocese of Orange in California. Um, we often talk on Spiritful Hearts uh, in, our, in our ministry, Spiritful Hearts, and on the show, Empowered by the Spirit, that the greatest journey is 18 inches from the head to the heart. Mm -hmm. That you can know about Jesus in the head, yeah. and even the demons yeah. know about That's Jesus. Right. That's right. But when you make Jesus Lord of your life, you put him in your heart. Mm -hmm. And then that transforms everything. It's like the prophet Jeremiah that said, you duped me, O Lord. I didn't want to share, but all of a sudden it's burning inside of me. You know, I mean, for me, we talk about it, uh, the Holy Spirit come upon us being released. The Holy Spirit that we receive in baptism, the Holy Spirit we receive in confirmation is released within us in which we, we're compelled to speak to other people about how much God loves us. Right, right. Yes, and, and it has to, this is the way maybe we can measure this. The measurement of a saint is that, uh, is joy, and uh, also um, the ability to, to share the good faith, to share and witness in a natural way. In other words, I'm not even working hard at it after a while. After a while, it's just me. <laughs> right, bubbles out of you. Exactly. And so that, you know, that's the way we measure, okay, am I doing that? Is, is that kind of my life picture? Or am I privatizing my religion so much? You know, um, because it's not to say that religion isn't working if, if I'm only going to Mass and only saying my rosary or wearing my scapular, you know, in a, a kind of, let's say, a private realm of religion. It's not to say that it's not working. Of course it is. Of course it is. But, but there's more still to this that could be so beautiful. And the more is becoming an apostle, you know, and, uh, and having that Holy Spirit event over and over again, which impels us to go outside of the, the room that's closed up. You know, so the, the apostles and Mary are in that room and they're safe and they're praying and it's beautiful. It's not that it isn't working, but then the Holy Spirit says, but there's more, it's beautiful, come with me, follow me. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, you know, the apostles begin this amazing adventure of um, preaching and of sharing and witnessing to their faith and, and to the most of them, except for John, you know, to even martyrdom. And you see this again in Acts 1.8, when Jesus told his disciples, soon the Holy Spirit will come upon you with great power, and then you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Everything changes when you open up your heart to receive the Holy Spirit. When you say yes to the Holy Spirit, when you become empowered by the Spirit, then you want to tell other people you are that fifth gospel. Mm -hmm. We often talk about being the fifth gospel here because I hear over and over again, I'm not educated, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know what to say, I'm not an expert, I'm not a priest, I'm not this, I can't really share with other people, but they can share the reason why they believe. Mm -hmm. They can share their own faith, mm -hmm. what Jesus has done to for them. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I think we only have to look at the, the saints. I, I'm a big lover and believer in the saints. Um, I preach on them. I, I think they're wonderful models and they're, they're ways that we can approach um, spirituality and approach our Lord that, that helps us in a, you know, on our own human level. But you can see that we've had great intellectual saints like St. Saint Thomas Aquinas or Bonaventure, and we have other saints like the children of Fatima who didn't have all that great education, but nevertheless, uh, we're privileged to receive the Blessed Mother and, and have given a message to the world that still resonates and still is important for us. Um, and so it, it's not a matter of uh, intellectual astuteness. God uses everyone um, in, in whatever place and situation we are. Um, I remember reading about uh, Mother Catherine Drexel, the great saint uh, of the United States, who in her, her final years was bedridden for many years and really couldn't do anything after a while. She, and yet she saw this as a great gift. The way she interpreted it was that she had always wanted to be a cloistered nun and to be a, you know, somehow in prayer. And now God gave her 
you know, this opportunity. So it's how we approach the difficulties and the demands and even the sufferings of life. Do we, do, do we receive those in a resentful way? Or, or do we see these as uh, new doors that God, who is so great, can do things even with the greatest suffering? So, Father, we often talk about a process of evangelization on this show and in our ministry. And the first process, part of that process, is wanting to evangelize, right? Is right. to have that desire. And then as part of that process is to ask the Lord to give you the words to say, to, to put you in that position in which when you encounter another person, you are speaking through the Holy Spirit with the power of the Holy Spirit and, and to recognize in faith that God will bring people to you. Yes. And so that yes. for us is really important. But you have to have that desire. You have to have the desire and you have to realize that it's not magic. Yes. And so that means uh, for us that it has to be imbued with prayer. Yes. And I, you know, we, we've heard the stories of how, again, St. John Paul II would spend an hour in prayer before celebrating Holy Mass and then almost as much time afterwards in Thanksgiving. And this is one of the most active popes that we've known. So to give ourselves to prayer doesn't take away from the activity. It actually hones it in. It actually uh, makes it bear better fruit. Mother Teresa knew that too. And... Uh, this is another um, insight, I think, uh, that the Holy Spirit has gifted us with this great devotion and love for uh, the Blessed Sacrament in our time, adoration. Look how young people respond Amen. to adoration. It's an amazing thing. It's fantastic. And, and yet, um, again, this is our Lord who, working with His church and in His church, um, provides something, um, a, a way, um, a reminder that we need Him and that by approaching Him on our knees um, and, and loving Him uh, with our hearts, especially in adoration or in Holy Mass or in the sacraments. Um, this is the way that we regain our uh, natural disposition to goodness and to holiness. And, um, and then, of course, uh, the Mother of God is, of all the saints, the Mother of God, St. Michael, I could go on and on about all of that. But um, the Virgin Mary is a, in a very important part. And how fortunate you and I are that in our Catholic faith, in the ancient churches, there is this great natural love for Mary. How can you explain it? How can Catholics really explain it? We just love her. And when you try to explain that to a Protestant, sometimes it's, it's difficult because it's so natural, which is beautiful, right? But, um, but a Protestant may not have that, that gift. You know, you can't understand it quite. And so um, I, I just think we're, we're tremendously blessed. Now, I will say that at the same time that we have this, these personal resources, um, we do need some help, um, some extra help. And, and so this is why uh, in my work in the Diocese of Orange, we've started a partnership with, um, uh, with uh, Catechetical Institute of Franciscan University, Steubenville. Wow. And so all our teaching well, the great part of our teaching is going to be coming through that institute um, for our basic certification, master catechist, and recertification. But not only that, I mean, anyone will be able to register and be begin taking these wonderful courses starting July 1st uh, of this year, coming very, very soon. And so the, the hope that we have is that by doing this, um, we will be getting excellent and faith-filled uh, presentations of the faith uh, into the home, especially right now with COVID. So it, it really is providential. But right now when we can't do live classes, which we have wonderful teachers, over a hundred teachers, priests, consecrated religious lay people in the diocese who are ready to do this, all set to do it. But because of the pandemic, um, they have to wait, they have to be patient. But look what happened. You know, this partnership that we were uh, about and trying to get on, off the ground with uh, uh, Steubenville has now become really important because that's going to be our major way of getting across the faith to people, uh, to teachers and catechists, at least at this moment. And when you have that desire to say yes to Jesus, he will give you the, the really the momentum and, and really the inspiration to want to learn more, to want to gather more information, yeah. to go to scripture, 
to study more. And again, this is a very exciting opportunity within the Diocese of Orange that we have to get more education in which you can better understand what is it that God is calling you to do when you share with those around you. Mm -hmm. This is Deacon Steve Greco. You're on Empowered by the Spirit. We're going to be right back to talk more about evangelization now. Okay, good? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, I'm just going to mention this book that I wrote on Be Not Afraid to, and, and then uh, let's get more into the actual study and your vision and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So far, so good, Michael? Yeah, great. Okay, okay. good. Yeah. Two thumbs up. All right. Hello everyone, we're back on Empowered by the Spirit. This is Deacon Steve Greco with Father Al Baca, who is the Director of Evangelization and Faith Formation for the Diocese of Orange in California. And, you know, it is our supreme duty, I'll keep going back to that, to say yes to the Lord, to say, use me, melt me, mold me, use me, use me in a powerful way to share my faith with those around me. So many times people think, well, I'm not educated, and we've been talking a little bit about that and the, the new program that, that the Diocese of Orange is offering, but it is that desire that is so important. And when you are in prayer, because that is critical, and I, I just wrote a book, Miracles Through Prayer, uh, and the forward is by Bishop Kevin Van here in the Diocese of Orange, talking about the various aspects of prayer, but prayer is communication. Prayer is wanting to be one with Jesus in which you open up your heart and let Jesus come to you and really love you and, and give you that direction, that guidance. Um, actually, in the month of March, I really felt the inspiration um, led by the Lord to write a book called Be Not Afraid. And in here, it is specifically related to what's going on with the pandemic and COVID-19. And I have Praying with Power, Faith Not, peer, not Fear, uh, Overcoming Adversity, um, Again, Turn to Your Mother, Examination of Conscience. But I have Share the Truth, which is tell, telling people how to evangelize. Uh, we have two parishes that have given this out to to their entire parish, St. John the Baptist in Costa Mesa. Father Augustine Pugner actually wrote the foreword. And then also last weekend at six masses, uh, we gave it out at Santiago de Capistello with, with Father Thomas. Uh, and the reason why this is so important is that we, we have to have faith and not fear now and always in which we want to share our faith uh, with other people and not worry about what happens. And I love what Mother Teresa says. She says, we are called to be faithful. We are not called to be successful. It is Jesus that gives us the success. Right. <laughs> she told me that. I met her once. And, oh, wow. And she said that to me. So <laughs> Seriously? Really me. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Tell us more about that. How well, did that we impact were, you? That was uh, back when I was a seminarian and uh, for the Diocese <laughs> of Orange. And she came to Long Beach do a prayer, wow. uh, a rosary rally. Wow. And it was packed, of course, and she talked about um, uh, abortion and life, and it was beautiful, and having confidence in, in the Mother of God. And afterwards, uh, the seminarians, we had a, a moment to come in and just say hello to her, and uh, she gave us a, a miraculous medal, each one. And when she put the medal in my hand, she said, remember, you're not called to be famous, you're called to be faithful. Yes. And, I, and I've always remembered that, too. It's, it's wonderful advice. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just so important because so many times people worry, well, I shared with someone and nothing happened. But you don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. I remember, you know, for example, share, and, and I really emphasize, again, sharing your faith with your children, your grandchildren, mm -hmm. you know, your brothers, your sisters, your spouse, whatever it might be, but say with your children. My daughter would say to me, I don't want to hear it. I don't want you even to talk about it, mm. you know. I and and you know you you might be led to give up in those circumstances, mm -hmm. but for me, I said, okay, all I'm being is faithful that I'm going to share my faith. And then you know she has stage four cancer, and and mm -hmm. when the cancer came, she called me up and said, can we pray? Yeah. yeah. And then you know another time she never prayed the rosary. She said, "Can we pray the rosary? Teach me how to pray the rosary." Right. And now she talks about her faith all the time. Mm -hmm. You just never know when it's going to uh, really blossom, mm -hmm. you know. And all we do is plant the seeds. 
Well, let me take it a step further, too, because we, we have to remember that when our Lord was uh, preaching and when he was witnessing uh, to the love of the Father, uh, he was rejected. And there were some people that actually didn't come back. Right, and uh, I think we need to remember that that that's part of our experience too. It has sure, to be sure. Is that there are going to be? Thank God that you know, in in the story you just related, that your daughter um, uh, opened her heart and was able to see that um, that Christ was there and prayer was there for her, and you were there. Um, but there are some people that uh, we're not going to be able to reach, and that's just part of it. But we still have to announce the good news with the hope that it will make sense. It will finally bear fruit. And it can be too that, okay, um, Father Al is not going to be able to open this heart, but maybe another priest will. Yes. You know, and I've always thought this is the wisdom of the church by putting two, three priests in a parish is that you have three different priests. So everybody, people have an option, you know, uh, because some people, maybe their personalities don't fit and that kind of thing but um, it takes the, the, the burden off all of that. But the point being that you and I are not messiahs. There is a messiah already. We just serve him. There were 12 apostles. So what John couldn't do, Peter could do, and so forth. And so, um, it, it, and it's all about being part of that tapestry, right? So there's, in the tapestry, there's no thread that's more important than another thread. They're all important. Exactly, and if you look at that tapestry on the back, it looks like chaos, <laughs> yes, that's right? right? <laughs> that's but then right. you flip it over and it's perfect. That's right. You know, and that's exactly what our lives are about. Yeah. You know, we don't see necessarily the end result. Yes. But one other thing I want to share very quickly, my background, I was senior vice president of a very large company, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, Fortune 25 company, mm -hmm. and I was responsible for like 4,000 salespeople. I would say to them that on average, you're gonna make a sale one out of 14 times. Hmm. But in making a sale one out of 14 times, we develop seven billion dollar products. Yeah, so the point I'm making is the fact is, you don't know, you, you're communicating with people and maybe it's one out of whatever number it is. Mm -hmm. And like you say, maybe it's someone else who's gonna plant more seeds and whatever, mm -hmm. and maybe they'll never receive it. But what your responsibility is, is to be obedient mm -hmm. and to be disciplined. And I, I always relate to the word disciple, which means to be disciplined, mm -hmm. you That's know? Right. And your thoughts on that? Well, um, uh, I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, I was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking back how, um, you know, tying into vocations a little bit. Uh, when I was studying to be a priest, uh, oftentimes one of the signs that we were asked is do people come up to you and say, have you ever thought about being a priest? And, um, and that this was an important part of discernment because if people aren't noticing that there's something different about you or, or something that could be um, blessed by God and by the church, then maybe you're not being called. You know, that, that really was what it was all about. Well, what happens when people stop saying that? What happens when people become so privatized that they say, well, he's a really good guy, a really wonderful woman, but, but wow, well, I, I, you know, I'll pray for him, but I won't actually say something. Well, th then those pieces begin to break down, so that discernment becomes harder. But if there is um, someone that you see that is living a life that just seems to be um, in tune with God and what, what the needs are of the, of the church and so forth, um, then take a step. You know, you never know. I mean, there was one time when in confession, without breaking the seal, I, I don't even remember much detail about it. It's been many years, but I remember all of a sudden I had this inspiration to ask a young man that was on the other side of the screen, um, I, have you ever thought of being a priest? And uh, I said, I think the Lord is calling you to be a priest. And, and then he just was quiet, and then he said, how do you know that? And he said, I just uh, finished the application process for, for entry. Praise God. And he, said, and he was so happy because it was a real confirmation of what he had you know, struggled Absolutely. with and decided to do. You know? And so this is the kind of way that God works so beautifully is if we would just act on our inspirations. You know, this comes from the Holy Spirit, inspiration. Amen, amen. And, and so many times we, we shy away from it because we're afraid we might get rejected. We're afraid that somebody may laugh. We're afraid of whatever. But, but 
we're really selling ourselves short because if the faith is alive in our hearts, God will work miracles. And I'm so glad that you said that um, because God is in the miracle business and the definition of a miracle is his supernatural intervention in your right. life. That's right. In 1 Corinthians 12, there is, it talks about various uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, often they're, they're deemed charismatic gifts, but one is called the word of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if we open up our heart to the Lord, he will give you what to say to people. And, and you know, there are times when, you know, out of the blue, God just puts a thought in your mind, mm -hmm. you know, to share that. And people will say to you, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. You know, and it came from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. it, and, and so that's what's so exciting. And being a Christian, being a Catholic, is so exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and that excitement is something that is important to share. Because mm -hmm. people don't like, if you're just depressed, if you're down, if you're complaining, if you're, you know, all those things, well, they get enough of that already. So be excited about your faith and about what God has done for you. Right. Well, I mean, people are attracted to the Catholic faith. There is this really <coughs> um, wonderful interest in the non-Catholic world with us, even to the point of where it looks like persecution sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. where the media treats us uh, so badly sometimes. But, but it is because there is some kind of interest. Um, someone once told me, uh, you know, when you watch a scary movie and they... Uh, the uh, the bad guy or the or the bad spirit is in the church. They never do that in a you know in a church that isn't Catholic. It's always Catholic. Why? Because they want the imagery. Because they want the mystery, the the beauty. Because they know that that is what um, uh, tells the whole story. You know. And and I always thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting, really. That it's an interesting observation. But I think the the deeper uh, uh, story of it is that the world is always interested because the Catholic faith, because the ancient church is the uh, testimony of Christ and um, uh, the full Christian family even. I mean all of us, uh, even though we are separated from each other, um, God works through us as we know and to a uh, beautiful extent in the Catholic faith where we believe that we have the fullness of revelation, what was given you know, and intended by uh, Jesus Christ. So for you and for me to, to be convicted, for you and me to be possessed by the Holy Spirit, and these are words that are sometimes scary to Catholics, like what do you mean convicted? What do you mean possession? I thought that was only for the devil. Well it is, but it's also for the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if, I don't want to be possessed by the, the devil, I want to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. You know, and in the same way that in a possession of darkness when that happens, um, it takes over a soul by force, but the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Holy Spirit possesses us by choice. We, we choose the Holy Spirit, and then He begins to reshape and reform us and, you know, and make us into what we should have been, um, what we, we can be. Um, that beautiful image that God the Father has of each one of us always in front of His face. I have to tell you this quick story, and I've said it before, but it's one of my favorite stories. Um, at the SCRC convention in yes. Anaheim, uh, every year my wife and I pray over the children, uh, ages 5 to 15, for the release of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And a couple years ago, this young uh, child, young girl, age 7, uh, came running up to me. Uh, this was on a Saturday. On Sunday, I was going to give a talk at, and at the conference. And she came running up with her mother, and the mother, they, they just flagged me down. They said, oh, Deacon, my, my daughter could barely sleep last night. She was so excited when you prayed over her. And, um, she, and, and the mother said, but she has a very important question to ask you. And so she looked at me, her eyes dilated, and she said, Deacon, did I receive the Holy Spirit at baptism? And I said, yeah, that's great. And then she looked at me and asked the most important question I've heard in 45 years in ministry. <laughs> she asked me, the seven-year-old looks at me, and she tilts her head, her eyes dilated, and she said, Deacon, if I receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, why is he hiding? Why is he hiding? That is the story. The, the story is, 
and that we have to give permission for the Holy Spirit to be released within us. Right, right. We have to say, come Holy Spirit, in kindling us the fire of your love. And when we give permission, then everything changes and then we evangelize. This is Deacon Steve Greco. We're gonna be right back to talk more about evangelization now after the break. Is that not true, though? Yeah, it was just a classic. <laughs> she said, well, then why is he hiding? <laughs> those, are, those are the hardest questions that come from kids, yeah. actually. Why is he hiding? Yeah. And, and, but to me, I talk about it all the time in my talks because it's like, yeah, if the Holy Spirit isn't manifest in us, yeah. then we're just not allowing him yeah. to be manifest. Yeah, 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 yeah. We get him at baptism. We give him a confirmation, right? Yeah. So, okay, then we're in the fourth, right? Uh, so this is 13 minutes. Um, what do you want to cover in our final wrap up here? Um, I want to come back to that, be what you just talked about. I okay. want to tell a story about that. Okay. Um, and then I think uh, uh, let's just go back and hit on um, like right now what's going on right. in the nation. Got it. How do we approach it? Okay, got it. This is Deacon Steve Greco. We're back with Father Al Baca, who is the Director of Evangelization and Faith Formation for the Diocese of Orange, California. And so you like my story about the little girl. It was, it was so a impactful. Great story. I mean, it's a great story because oftentimes, as I said, um, que questions that come from kids are the most profound sometimes. And really, have to you have to step back and think about, okay, how do I answer this? But I, I remember in my, my own life, uh, when we were being prepared for confirmation, and uh, at St. Columban School, and I remember a uh, sister talking about all the beautiful things about confirmation, what's going to happen, the Holy Spirit who's going to come to you, it's going to change your life, and so forth, Be you know, beautiful things. And I remember, uh, this was eighth grade, I went through confirmation, and then nothing happened. And I went back, uh, you know, maybe a week later, and kind of reflected on it, and I still felt the same as I did before. So I was like, what happened? Nothing happened. And I, I really got anxious about it, and I uh, sat down with Sister, and I said, Sister, what happened? Nothing happened. And she said, you know, you have to be patient. And she said, because there is a right moment, and it will happen. Amen. And one of the things she said, too, is, you know, sometimes even we build up little walls, and they have to come down first. And it's not the fault of God. It's that God is waiting for those little walls to come down so that he can really blossom in your life. Well, and then years later, I'm in uh, high school, we went on a, a trip through Europe, and uh, students and teachers, and of course we had to go to St. Peter's uh, in Rome, and uh, beautiful, extraordinary, you know, uh, church. And you may remember that there's a statue of St. Peter seated on a throne, a bronze statue, and right. the um, custom is to kiss the, the foot, right? Um, of St. Peter, his foot is out at, from the statue, and it's worn down quite a bit because over the centuries from so much kissing, it's, you know, his foot is beginning to kind of disappear. And so here I am with all my friends, most of them Protestant, and there was a line, and, and I wanted to go up and do that, and, but they were like, well, you know, why are they kissing the foot, you know, of a, of a statue, you know, and, and inwardly I was thinking, hey, you know, I really don't want to get into all of that, and uh, here I'm in high school, and uh, so I, I said, well, I'm going to go and, and uh, uh, get in the line, and I'm going to say prayer. I'm going to put my hand on the foot and say prayer, and I thought, that, that's good. So I got in line, and, and we, there we are, we going up, and, and so I get to um, the uh, bronze statue in front of me of St. Peter, and I begin my prayer, private prayer, and then I thought, oh, what, you know, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and so I bent down and I kissed the foot and all of a sudden, just like that, I got slain by the Holy Spirit. Oh, praise and, the Lord. And I fell right over onto the floor, <laughs> the marble floor, and everybody rushed to see what's wrong. You know, he's, we have to take him to the hospital or something. And, and it was the most beautiful moment. Oh, that's and wonderful. And I was just, you know, aware and, and at the same time caught up in something. And I knew right there in that moment deacon i knew what sister told me those years before it now happened for me wow. for whatever reason i couldn't you know uh clear out whatever that little wall was or something right but but the lord determined this is where it was going to happen this is when it was going to happen and i finally was ready to receive uh, that gift it was perfect timing in the fullness of time which is so important yeah. right now um 
you know, I, I, I love Chinese proverbs. And one of the Chinese proverbs uh, that, uh, that I often think about is that proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when they said that, they didn't particularly mean uh, something positive. <laughs> but this is interesting times, to sure say the is. least. And, and so I believe it's a great time of evangelization, a great time yes. to grow in faith. But tell us about these interesting times from yes. your perspective. Well, look, um, all of us have been dissatisfied that we've had to um, temporarily close our churches. There's been a lot of conversation about that. But the point, I mean, all of us agree that none of us like that. And we're happy that we're beginning to, again, get back to opening our churches for, for Holy Mass and, and God willing for, you know, uh, private prayer even. But there are certain things that I, I saw during that time that, that really um, impacted me quite a bit. One was that we had um, a procession of the Blessed Sacrament through the neighborhoods, and we put the Blessed Sacrament on the top of a cab of a truck. And um, Bishop Tim Fryer held the monstrance in place. Awesome. And we went through the streets uh, slowly, um, because the idea, you know, the procession is not really so much about, it is about the people and it isn't. It's about giving a public witness, right, uh, that we believe in Christ and the, in the Holy Eucharist. And it's good that we do that in the parking lot of the church, but that's not what it's meant to do. You're supposed to go out into the streets. Amen. So you don't witness to the people in the choir already, right? Right, you witness amen. outside. The second thing is, this is for Jesus to go out to the people you know, to his people that are not Catholic, to his people that are not religious, to his people that don't care. This is the church lovingly bringing him out to all of these people. And we um, had the bells uh, pealing when he left the church to say the king has left his home, his church, and then uh, going through the streets and then coming back, then the bells pealing again that the king has returned, you know, to mm. his church. Wow. And there was a, a guy on a Harley Davidson and he was all, you know, your typical, what you would think a stereotype, right? Bandana, everything, dark glasses. And when he saw um, the uh, Blessed Sacrament coming, he stopped in the, the middle of the street there, got off his bike and just bowed his head as the Blessed Sacrament mm. uh, went by. Then he got on the, the motorcycle and then he traveled behind it. Oh wow! Until we finally got back to the church, and then he came into the parking lot. Praise and God! And then into, and then we had adoration outside, and then we had holy mass. Oh, beautiful! And and this was the you know the kind of things that you say, wow, you know that it it's it's a who knew that taking the blessed sacrament out might touch the heart of this man and have that transformation, right. that metanoia, you right. know, to have that from the head to the heart experience, and and we just never know. That's right. We never know. I mean, there are times that I'm uh, in line, say, for the groceries, and of course, this is pr prior to the pandemic, but, um, and the Lord will say, say something encouraging, tell that cashier about me, mm -hmm. you know, and the mm -hmm. same thing will happen with a waitress, or same thing will happen, I was at uh, uh, a, a gas station, and my car was being fixed, and, and I, I talked to the station uh, manager there, the garage manager, about Jesus, and asked him about you, but only because God put that in my heart mm -hmm. to bring it up, you know, and, and when you have a willing desire, that's when things change, mm -hmm. and which is so important. So I, I can't say uh, enough thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your yes. Thank you for being a priest, but thank you for being in charge of evangelization oh, and faith you, formation. Now for our listening audience again, uh, those within the Diocese of Orange, uh, what can they do to participate now in this program starting in July? Well, the first thing you can do is register. Once you register, then uh, it opens up to um, a wealth of teaching um, that's in English, in Spanish. The Spanish section you know, keeps building up. Um, and especially if you're interested, if you think you would like to share the faith as a teacher or a catechist at whatever age level, then this is the route to go because basic certification in every diocese is um, that uh, kind of schooling that happens so that um, a parish, a pastor knows that someone is prepared to uh, instruct and to teach the, the Catholic faith. So um, the, what, what we have set up is going to be um, engaging. It uh, 
also has mentorship uh, involved in that, mentors who walk with you and accompany you as you're going through uh, your learning. And all of this uh, um, in order to uh, create that confidence and that ability, you have someone else who's walking with you and, and saying, you're doing a good thing, and this is, uh, let me pray with you. Um, let's um, talk about what you learned and, and see how does that impact your life? You know, what does that mean for you as, as a believer? And uh, so I, I think that's one of the great ways that my office is providing something very essential and, um, and, and I think very attractive to people. We also have um, Matthew Kelly coming in January, which is going to be a wonderful two-day event uh, for the Diocese of Orange. And um, uh, a number of other projects uh, that we still have uh, a little bit of work to do on, but I think are going to be almost as exciting as the Matthew Kelly event. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, a great year of evangelization. And I, I just want to maybe end it this way, too, to say, you know, I've always been convinced that through COVID and everything else, this actually was a golden moment for evangelization. Amen. So we should not feel defeated, shy away, or think there's a, this is a bad time and we're going to wait for a good time to come. No, the, the, it is a bad time, but it is also a good time because God never, never allows darkness to have the last word and uh, to evangelize and to, to share the faith now when people really are asking questions and looking for, I think, looking for meaning. Two of my favorite scriptures, Father, is First Thessalonians 5.18. In all circumstances give thanks yeah, for this, the yeah. will for you in Christ Jesus. So what are you giving thanks for? You're giving thanks because this is a great opportunity for faith, growth, and evangelization. And of course, Romans 8, 28, in which God makes all things work for good, for he who loves the Lord is called according to his purpose. So yes, this is incredibly challenging time, but it is a time in which Jesus tells us over and over again, behold, I make all things new. And I think it's pretty safe to say that there's lots of new things <laughs> happening today, right? Right, right? You know, online conferences, the way we're thinking, right, the way right. we're praying, the way we're doing things mm -hmm. is new. And But embrace it, embrace it, and know that, hey, we all want COVID-19 behind us. Mm -hmm. We wanna move forward. But while we're here, there's great opportunities to share our faith. And a lot of people are hurting. Yes. And what a great opportunity to give hope which is a big part of sharing our faith. And, and I think even with the race pressures that are around us right now, um, that it, it seems like week by week there's, there's a new element or there's a new angle added to all of this. And, and some of it is, is really um, uh, led by, we'll say, the anarchists who really are not part of the solution, don't really want to be part of the solution that we're looking for as Catholics. Um, but uh, I think, too, we have to give witness also, especially in this moment, of that um, uh, the Catholic Church and Christian faith does hold that all people are made into the likeness and image of God. Amen. And that uh, there is that equality of soul that is there. Amen. And that any injustice that is there needs to be confronted and eradicated. And then I, I look at our, again at our saints. Hey, we are a, a wealth of different cultures. And we have that especially in our saints. Look at St. Martin de Porres, who yes. is beloved in the Catholic Church. Yes. Almost every culture, he's an interesting saint because we have some saints that are very particular to one culture, but um, Martin de Porres just runs the span of, of cultures. Um, or uh, any of the uh, Teresa of Avila or any of the other uh, great saints that are from different uh, parts of the world. And yet, you'll find them in all our churches. Amen. Father, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for all that you're doing for all of us. And we'd love to have you back again. That'd be great. Yeah. So could you close us out in prayer? I will. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your greatness, your love, your goodness. We um, acknowledge that we are made in your image and likeness. And because of that, we know that we are called even to greatness, to uh, sainthood. And we pray, Lord, that in the ways that have been given to us and the lives that have been given to us, we pray that we will be able to witness to you and to do what we can to further the message and the love of the church and the salvation of souls. And especially this day, 
we ask through the intercession of John the Baptist, courage, strength, perseverance. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.